The problem with introducing a scientist such as Dr. Al Crosby is that it's impossible to condense his array of achievements into a little introductory paragraph. So Dr. Crosby is a professor across campus at Polymer Science and Engineering and is a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors. Among his many awards, Dr. Crosby has received the National Science Foundation Career Award, the College of Natural Science Outstanding Research Award, and most recently is a member of a team that received a million dollar grant from France, uh, from the French-based Human Frontier Science Program. His research has covered extensively in a popular medium. I'm sure you've seen him, Discovery Channel, Popular Science, CNET, NPR, CNN Money, which named Getzkin, which we're gonna hear about today, I'm certain, one of the top five science breakthroughs in 2012. So today, I think we'll be hearing about Gexkin and perhaps come to understand some of the science that underpins the pressure-sensitive adhesive tapes and membranes that we use to air seal in our buildings. So please welcome Dr. Crosby. This, is, this was an interesting invite when Carl asked me to um, come over and be part of this lecture series because I wasn't really sure what um, to lecture on. I think Carl sensed that a little bit. I went back and forth with a lot of different questions about who am I speaking to? What are you looking to learn? Um, are you even going to be interested in, in the story that I have to tell you? And um, what I've settled on, because I didn't know how much of this was kind of an entertainment section and how much of it was kind of trying to teach you something about adhesion. So I settled somewhere in between. Okay, so um, I want to give you that heads up right from the beginning that what I'm going to do at the, for the first couple slides, for the first many slides, is start to teach you about tape, okay, and pressure-sensitive adhesives. Has anybody ever heard the word pressure-sensitive, or the words pressure-sensitive adhesives before? <laughs> pressure-sensitive adhesives. Okay, of course. All right, a few. All right, but I saw a lot of heads shaking no. Uh, so pr pressure sensitive adhesives or PSAs, as they're referred to in the trade, are everything from scotch tape to duct tape and everything in between. So I'm going to give you a base, some base understanding of what those materials are, how their performance depends upon material properties, and then I'm going to take that and start to tell you about how we started to use biology and some observations from nature to change the way we think about adhesion and to take advantage of some different performance factors. Um, and all of this, I think, and I know that Carl and many other colleagues over here, um, we've had discussions over the last year, I think all of these concepts are, are ready and primed to have a large impact in architecture and in building and construction um, technology. Um, so I hope, you know, as we talk today, I'm, I'm happy to take as many questions throughout the lecture. I don't know if that's the style of this lecture series. I'm fine with it. If you feel like you don't understand something and you want to interrupt me, go for it. I'm, I'm totally fine with that. Um, I'm also happy, and I'm going to hopefully have it planned in here, that at the end of the lecture we'll have plenty of time for questions too. Um, so I want you to take away as much as you can or as much as you're interested in about how things stick together. Okay. Um, one thing that, just to build on the introduction um, and to tell you and to give you a little bit of um, maybe more confidence in what I have to say here, I've been working in the field, so my PhD was actually on pressure-sensitive adhesives, um, and that goes back about 22 years ago, um, and I've continued working in this field. This is now in my research group here at UMass. This is about a quarter of my research group is focused on adhesion. Um, so for the past 22 years or so, I've worked in the con on the context of adhesion. Um, so there's a lot more that I could say um, than what is in this lecture. So if you're interested and want to talk more, um, just bother me either here or, or later. Happy to talk. So adhesion is all around us. This is something that we know. Um, these are a few of the examples that we are probably uh, most familiar with. You know, whether we think about Liquid type adhesives, such as Elmer's glue, obviously everybody has played with Elmer's glue um, at some point. Probably most people have tried one of these very strong um, adhesives. 
or some type of sealant. These are used throughout, obviously, the building and architecture community quite a bit. Um, and so these are all applied in some type of liquid form. And then upon reaction, either with the air or the reaction with a substrate that they're in contact with, they will start to react and go from a liquid into a solid. Okay? This is things that you're familiar with just by experience. Other adhesives that we use a lot um, are shown down here. And this is where materials that are commonly called pressure-sensitive adhesives are found. So the pressure-sensitive adhesive is actually the part or a component of all of these products that are being shown down here. These are, in a sense, pressure-sensitive adhesives are delivered as a solid, and they remain as a solid throughout their time. Okay, we'll talk a little bit more about that um, as we go. But pressure-sensitive adhesives are actually used in a lot of other places, and I, I thought I'd show you a little video um, just to, hopefully we have sound in here. Um, Maybe this doesn't connect. You guys hear that? Get ready for this. Pink tape can be used to attach molding, trim, or other accessories to cars, buses, or boats. It can, and it is. Tape forms a strong bond that absorbs vibration and stands up to moisture and extreme temperatures. Pink tape can be used for heavy duty construction. It can, and it is. Pink tape is ideal for structural glazing, for holding architectural panels in place, and for sealing joints around windows. Pink tape can be used to protect against fire or to dampen the effects of an explosion. It can and it is. Tape is used as a fire barrier in ships and aircraft and to reinforce walls to protect against acts of terrorism and other catastrophic events. And pink tape can be used to sense temperature changes or the presence of a dangerous chemical. It can and it is. Tape can be engineered to communicate crucial safety information in a variety of applications. So, the next time you need to bond and fasten things together, or seal, or protect, or communicate, think tape, a bond you can trust. For more information on tape and its potential applications, visit thinktape.org. So did anybody ever hear of the Pressure Sensitive Tape Council? No? So full disclosure, I'm actually the academic advisor for the Pressure Sensitive Tape Council. My neighbors love to hear that because um, they can't even imagine that such a position exists. Um, and they can't even imagine that such an organization exists. But one of the things, I've actually worked with them for the past five or six years now, um, it's an awesome organization. It's actually one of the largest industries in the United States. So the tape industry itself is one of the largest industries, and it has a lot of manufacturing capabilities that are um, found and kind of extending into all other kind of businesses. So from flexible electronics to solar cells, the tape industry kind of combines a lot of the know-how that, that are impacting all of these other different um, industries. You know, um, roofing, for example, we talked about membranes and roofing. Pressure-sensitive uh, companies are being playing a big role in kind of rolling out um, flexible kind of roofing, new roofing materials and new membranes for architecture. Um, these are, it's a rather large industry and um, an old industry in the, in the United States. Um, so we learned about that tape can do everything, right? Tape basically can solve the world's problems um, as long as you know how to use it. Uh, and first of all, the question is, what is tape? So tape that we're used to working with is basically comprised of three different parts, OK? Um, first of all, you have this pressure sensitive adhesive. And that is typically the sticky part that you're used to touching and you know, playing with. If, you know, at least when I was a child, I was always fascinated by taking scotch tape, putting it down onto a table, and peeling it off. It just felt kind of nice. Um, and so I liked it. And so the, the sticky part is the pressure sensitive adhesive. I'm going to tell you a little bit or a lot more about that in a few minutes. The sticky part is actually connected to a backing. That backing is usually permanently connected. So in, the, in a masking tape, everybody's familiar with a masking tape, it's the paper backing on the back. That's called the backing. Okay? 
I'm going to start to tell you, especially the story of Gexkin. I'm not going to talk about paper, but everything that we're going to do in the Gexkin story is going to be about changing the backing. Okay, um, the backing plays a huge role in the way uh, a tape works. Okay, actually, I'll, I'll start to argue it actually plays the most dominant role in the way a tape works is the backing and not the adhesive. And then finally, the third, and if you talk to the people or the companies that make release liners, they will say that this is the most critical part. And it probably is, um, because any time you buy tape, it's usually wound on itself in some way. And so there has to be a liner that sticks, but just the right amount. Basically, this liner needs to be able to peel away at the right time when you want to apply the tape. It keeps it clean. It keeps it in a, in a preferred or preserved state. Okay, and the chemistry between the liner and the adhesive can really influence the ultimate um, properties of the adhesive itself. Because if the liner, as you're peeling that liner away, if it peels away a layer of the molecules on the adhesive, your tape is not going to work anywhere near the way that you want it to work. And so sometimes if it has too much adhesion, you're going to ruin the adhesive. It has too little, then your whole product unwinds and ends up being scrapped on the in the in the building site or wherever you're working or in your basement um, too early. Okay, so it plays actually a very critical role. We're not going to talk a whole lot about the release liner um, today, although um, I've worked on it and can talk a lot about it if you if you wish. So, what is a pressure sensitive adhesive? This is going to be the first part, um, and what we're going to I just want to educate you a little bit in terms of what this material is. This material, or what's called a pressure-sensitive adhesive in the, in the trade, is typically comprised of three parts, okay? First, you have polymers. Polymers, you guys, do you know what polymers are? Feel okay with that? Nice, long molecules, really long molecules. You want to think about entangled spaghetti, but at a molecular level, okay? It's really an entangled ball of, of, of molecules. The difference between, so a, ball or a, a bowl of spaghetti, and you pick up that bowl or you, you, pick, you know, pick it up with your fork, it, there's many strands of spaghetti, right? But eventually, if you add some olive oil or some butter, those strands will disentangle and flow out, right, and flow back into your bowl. That's what, that's what we call a physical entanglement. If I go in and I, every time that two spaghetti chains or two molecules cross, I induce a reaction and get the chemistry from one chain to connect to the chemistry to the other. That's what I'm going to call a crosslink. Okay? Um, in pressure sensitive adhesives, you actually have combinations of both of these, entangled and crosslinked polymers. And they play different roles. Okay? The crosslink polymer is going to allow you to sustain stress over long times or sustain forces over long times. The entangled ones are going to allow you to dissipate or turn some of the mechanical energy of, say, a wind load into local heat. And that's going to allow you to dissipate the energy and basically blunt any kind of cracks that develop in your adhesive. So it's going to start to um, stabilize your system over time. And it's the formulation or the balance of these cross-linked and entangled systems that really give rise to a lot of the performance that you find from scotch tape to duct, duct tape and everything in between. Now, these materials, the entangled and crosslink polymers, typically have what is called a low glass transition temperature. So you, this is a concept that um, many people, especially outside of the materials or polymer community, are not very comfortable with but are used to. But if I take any material, I can go from a liquid to solid transition, usually thinking going from a, a liquid to a crystal, okay, like water to ice. Okay, as I decrease temperature. But if I take other materials, sometimes before I can crystallize and get all the atoms to arrange properly, they'll actually just jam and turn into a glass, just like what we see here. And well, we don't really see, but on the other side of these sheets, it's a glass. Okay, that happens as we change the temperature, decrease the temperature. The point at which that happens depends upon the chemistry. And usually the polymers that are used in a pressure sensitive adhesive, that transition from liquid to glass will occur far below freezing. So maybe 70 to 100 degrees below, um, below the freezing point of water. Okay, so far very cold temperatures is where um, that will occur. 
The reason why I'm telling you this is because all of these polymers at room temperature or really almost at any kind of living temperature that we would be living in, these polymers on a local level are basically all liquid-like. Even though they're feeling like a solid and they don't move very far, in reality, at a molecular level, they're all liquids. Okay, so pressure sensitive adhesives, that tacky surface is almost all acting like a liquid, or really is a liquid at, in its um, usable state. In addition to these polymers, they're going to add tackifiers. Classically, these tackifiers were basically resins taken out of wood. Okay, so they were all natural based resins. Now, a lot more of these materials are being synthetically derived just from byproducts of the oil industry or gas industry. Okay, coming out of the ground, it's a lot cheaper for them just to convert some of these different materials into some of the resins. The interesting thing about these resins um, is that they are all very high glass transition temperature materials. That means these little, they're basically little particles that you're going to be putting in, but they're all at room temperature or operating temperatures. They're basically like glass, so they're very rigid. Um, so, but they, they put these materials in to make it a little tacky. And that's a concept that we can talk more about, but it's, I want you to understand that we have a, this adhesive is really a composite at the molecular level of liquids blended with little pieces of glass. Okay? And then finally, there's a bunch of stabilizers. So a lot of polymers, a lot of resins will react under, under different humidity levels. They will react in the presence of ultraviolet light. They will react at different temperatures. These stabilizers, basically try to mitigate all of that and try to eat up any of the free radicals or control the humidity level in different ways. And there's a lot of art in terms of how to combine these um, stabilizers. We're not going to talk about stabilizers in this, in this lecture at all beyond these words. So this whole formulation of taking polymers entangled or cross-linked, adding with tachifiers, and then adding with stabilizers, it's basically done in the lab to achieve two processes with, with regards to adhesion. First is forming the interface. Okay, so if you're going to, an adhesive is used to join one material to another material. Okay, that's what the function of the adhesive is. And the, in order to join two materials, you have to form some type of an interface. The first forming of the interface is called wetting. This is in the trade, it's called wetting the interface or wetting the surface. And you all know that you can take water onto many leaves or water onto a freshly coated car or, or your kind of Teflon coated pan that you might cook on. You place it and it'll bead up. Basically, the water does not spread efficiently onto its surface. And this is because the surface energy of the leaf in this example, what's called surface energy, the surface energy is lower than the surface energy of water. Okay? So the system, the whole leaf and water system, wants to maximize or expose as much of the leaf as possible because it's the lowest energy form. It doesn't have to work hard to be there, okay? So it wants to minimize all of its contact, and it'll do that by beating up the water. If you make this leaf very high surface energy, like a metal, a metal actually has very high surface energy, then what you'll find is all of these water droplets will spread out into a molecularly thin layer and just try to cover every aspect of it on its own, okay? The reason I'm telling you this, one, is to start to educate you with some of these terms, but two, is that you, all systems that really want to have a long bond, you want to use adhesives, whether they start out in their liquid state or whether they start out in their tape state, where this factor, this spreading coefficient, is greater than zero. And, your, and materials formulators know how to um, calculate this. Okay? And if you have this, where if the spreading coefficient is greater than zero, then all these droplets will form a, a one layer. And that's the, that's the most stable state that your interface can be in at the beginning. Okay? And if you're not starting from that point, then you're going to be, you're basically working up um, or, or running uphill. It's going to be a hard process to keep your adhesive and your bond um, stable over a long time. It's kind of like putting a nail into a drywall, you know, without any kind of anchor behind it. Um, it's, it's, it'll hold for a little while, but it's not going to be stable, okay, over long times. 
if you don't form a good interface, then you're not going to be able to hold up any kind of load over your whole um, application or design. And so this is really what it's about. Maximizing the area of your interface is always the first strategy for strength. And there are a number of factors, not just the surface energy. We're going to talk about other factors that really play a role in terms of not allowing you to achieve this. Okay? And this is, if you're familiar, if you've used adhesives in any kind of different bonding applications, you know that there's a lot of surface preparation that usually people like to have you clean the surface, or sometimes they'll have you put down a primer coating first. This primer coating is doing the surface preparation for you and changing the surface energy, just like I described, basically turning this leaf from um, a, a low surface energy surface to a high surface energy surface, and it allows the, he the adhesive on the molecular level to spread and to want to cover everything it can. Okay? Now, forming the interface is one thing, and I'm not going to tell you more about strategies of that because I'm going to tell you about separating the interface and how to prevent the separation once you form the interface. Because the separation of the interface is where you start to be able to predict the loads and the stresses that you can carry. Okay? And in my way of thinking, anyway, um, I don't know, Carl didn't uh, mention, um, so I'm a civil engineer, actually on the structural side, by my undergraduate training. Um, and so I like to think about force distribution, load distribution, and, and all kinds of structures. And the way that you're actually going to be able to go in and predict how to join two interfaces and to be able to sustain over the sustained time or the sustained conditions is by understanding about how to predict the separation process at the interface or how much force it's going to um, um, be able to sustain. And that's what most of my lecture is going to be about. Okay? So in order to understand and describe the separation process in a pressure sensitive adhesive, the way you need to think about this is from a fracture point of view or a crack, okay? Everything that has been developed in the adhesive community um, and adhesion science is built around describing the separation between this adhesive, okay, this is a piece of tape being separated from a glass, glass plate here. When they're just pulling up on this glass of plate, just, or on this adhesive, just like you're um, peeling a piece of scotch tape. And if you look in, as you peel away, you're going to see that the bond actually stretches and forms all these little fibers and fibrils as you, as you debond the tape and run it across the glass. And this, this process um, is described through a fracture process. So this is just like the cracking of a, a ship, okay, or the cracking of this wood beam here. The mechanics of how you describe this and relate force to the geometry and the material properties is all described by a concept that was um, developed almost 100 years ago in 1921 by a, a person by the name of Arnold um, Griffith, Arnold Allen Griffith. Okay? And Griffith, um, like I said, he developed this in 1921. Unfortunately, the lessons brought about by the Griffith fracture mechanics theory had not saved the Liberty ships. I don't know if you're familiar with this example in, in history, um, but the boats and many structures back prior um, to the war were not really developed with a deep understanding of the, of, the, of the propagation of cracks in metal or in ceramics. Fracture mechanics had not really spread that far, and so everything was designed around a maximum stress, which is very common. I mean, as you probably know, as architects, you often define a stress Okay, in terms of the ultimate strength. But an ultimate stress actually does not describe the, when a crack will actually propagate. Okay, you have to reformulate this a little bit to understand really how cracks will propagate through a system. And that's not only true in the middle of a material, like going through the middle of a ship, but it's also true at an interface when you're bringing a soft adhesive into contact with a glass or a ceramic or a piece of metal. Okay? So what Griffith introduced was this term called strain energy release rate. And I'm going to put up some equations in a few slides, but we're, what, I'm, um, what I want you to understand, this, this factor G, and that it's given the symbol of G because of Griffith, um, basically describes if I 
if I change the length of this crack, okay, if we look at this picture here as a crack, this wedge, and I make it just a little bit longer, just a, a small amount longer, how much elastic energy, how much of the energy stored in the bending of this plate, okay, or the bending of this, of this tape, will be released by making the crack just a little longer. So all I'm doing is asking myself, if the crack is this long or this long, what's the difference in the stresses and strains in this, in this piece of tape? And I can calculate that, okay? I can calculate how much the stress is different one, from one geometry to the next geometry. I take that difference and I can calculate how much the energy is. And what that tells me is that all of the elastic energy that changed from going from this point to this point, that energy was required to actually create new surfaces. Okay, I'm actually creating two new surfaces by going from one point to the next. And so this is the trade-off of an elastic energy turning into a surface energy. Okay, and it's this balance that controls when things will um, move back and forth. Okay? And it's, and I'm going to show you my whole, one of my big points at the beginning of this lecture is to show you that calculating that is actually different than just understanding stress alone. Okay? So if, so, oh, I forgot, um, no, I didn't. Um, this, this calculation of G is a function of the force and displacement or the stretching of this tape. It's a measure, it's a function of the mechanical properties, so the material properties of the adhesive here. It's a property, the properties of the glass or the metal or whatever I'm in contact down here. And it's a function of the size and shape of this bond, okay? If this factor G is greater than a critical value, that's what the C stands for, a critical value, then it's going to debond, okay? Or, in, not in the interface, but it's also going to control when a, my ship is going to crack in half. This critical factor of G is a combination. It's, called, it's not a material property. It's a materials property because it dic is dictated by the materials of the adhesive as well as the substrate that it's in contact with. You must know something about the properties of both in order to understand when things are going to debond or not. Okay? It's also a function of temperature, rate, humidity, time, okay? All of these different environmental factors will influence the material properties largely of the adhesive, but also of the backing, um, and sometimes things like glass or metal. So what are the material properties that start to control the separation? Um, first, and this is a very poor schematic, but I want you to think about this as your wall, okay? This is um, some type of plate that you're trying to glue to your wall. And in between is your adhesive, okay? And your adhesive is comprised of these green strands, which are the cross-linked polymers, the yellow or orange strands here that are the entangled polymers, these purple tachyfiers, and all of these are mixed together, either in a disordered way, as I've shown here, or they can sometimes be ordered. And what this sets up is that you have two regimes. One is the interface, which is directly in contact between either this load that we're putting on to the adhesive and the polymer, or polymers, or this wall and these polymers. So right at the interface, right at the, the few nanometers or at the molecular level, there's some different properties right at the interface. But there's also some bulk material in, inside or away from this interface. The reason I want to start pointing this out is in terms of understanding adhesion, you have to know something about the properties right at the interface. So when this green polymer matches with this white load um, or this orange polymer or purple tachyphyre matches with this, touches it um, or becomes very, very close, those properties will be different than when the green interacts with the orange in a separate way. But both play an important role in terms of controlling your adhesion. So the way they come in, first, right at the interface, you can set up a number of different um, bonds, okay? And I'm not going to quiz you on any of this. Um, this goes back to chemistry, and I'm guessing that, well, maybe you like chemistry, maybe you don't. I won't make an assumption. Um, but there are a number of different bonds that can form. You probably remember these maybe from high school. 
ionic bonds, covalent bonds, metallic bonds. These are the energies per mole of these bonds. You can see that ionic bonds and covalent bonds are your strongest, okay? They're the biggest numbers, basically. Almost no adhesive that you're ever going to use in architecture is made with any of these bonds, okay? And in fact, almost all of your adhesives that you use today and that will be used in the near future are going to be made with what are called Van der Waals bonds. And if you can compare these numbers, my point in showing you this is that they are the weakest bonds, okay? The thing about Van der Waals bonds, and I'm going to show you, the gecko only uses Van der Waals bonds too, okay? They're the weakest bonds, but they exist everywhere. So if I bring my finger into contact with this table or this podium right now, Van der Waals bonds are acting in between my two materials brought into contact, okay? So Van der Waals bonds basically exist anywhere I bring two materials close enough. If they get down to a molecular level of separation, Van der Waals bonds are going to act. And they're kind of, so to give you a picture of what Van, has anybody heard of Van der Waals bonds before? You guys are quiet. I'm going to get into some videos, don't worry, really soon. So Van der Waals bonds are like a little, basically at the molecular level, what you're doing is you're separating temporarily the electrons and the protons and you set up a little magnet um, or a little dipole. I don't know what's called, but a little magnet you can think about right at the molecular level. So it's a little temporary magnet if you want to think about it that way. So this is um, one part of the bond, or one part of the problem of controlling and making your adhesive strong is controlling the bond at the interface. But Van der Waals bonds are basically everything that you're going to, you don't have to do much for. They're going to be described in a property that we've already highlighted, GC. Sometimes you will hear about G0. And sometimes you hear about W. Just think about all of these the same. They're relating basically to the strength of these Van der Waals bonds. And if you do some special chemistry, they can relate to the bonds, whatever chemistry you're putting in. Not really important for today's lecture, but it gives you a little primer. The other properties that play a big role in understanding adhesion um, are the mechanical properties. And these, the most important property that we're going to talk about today is the elastic modulus. Okay, which is the material's resistance to stretching, okay, or resistance to deformation. The units of this are um, force per area or stress, so megapascals or um, pounds per square inch. And if we want to think about the temperature dependence or the time dependence of these, of the elastic modulus, they're typically called um, E prime and E double prime. So this is the storage modulus and the loss modulus, okay? These are what's called a viscoelastic parameter. The other property that becomes important is Poisson's ratio. So if I, if I pull on a material like this, the strain in the orthogonal direction is it's going to neck, right? Or it's going to come in a little bit. Um, the ratio between how much I pull in this direction and how much the material contracts orthogonally is the um, Poisson's ratio. Okay? Um, and that's a material property. So this, both of these are dictated by the chemistry of the bulk, let's say, the modulus and the Poisson's ratio. Now, if I start to take adhesives and I start to peel them from a surface, so something like this, I have an adhesive, okay, and I'm applying some type of force as I peel it along and peel it away. If I measure the amount of force as a function of the amount of displacement during a peel force, I'm going to have a graph that looks like this, or a relationship. It's going to first be linear. I'm going to hit some initiation peak. And then I'm going to reach a steady state. And this force will stay steady during the whole propagation of a, of a bond. This is a very conventional way of thinking about and testing pressure sensitive adhesives. Okay? It's, a, it's a powerful way. And when you go to find literature, in your, if you buy different products, they're going to specify a peel force. And what they're specifying is this plateau here. Okay. Now, what's good about knowing that is that as long as you understand the standard and the material that they're um, measuring this with, then maybe you can do something with it. But you have to be able to understand how it, how it relates to other geometries. Because probably you're not going to be building a bond like this in your house or in your building. Okay? You're not going to be peeling too many things. Okay? Um, your loads are either going to be normal loads. So this is a, like a post coming down into contact with an adhesive, okay? 
and we're applying some normal force. So let's say these projectors are being hung by an adhesive, okay, at that, at that ceiling. This would be the, the way your force displacement energy would look like. And so you need to be able to translate this performance here into this performance there. And that's where you need to be able to work with your materials engineers or start to educate yourself or work with your formulators to make sure that you're taking that transformation correctly. I'm going to provide some of the base, bases today. Um, the other thing, and we're, we'll talk about it when we talk about Gexkin, I mean, obviously, you sometimes apply a shear load as well. Say if I want to hang a picture up on this wall with an adhesive or hang a plate, um, then it's under a pure shear load. It's going to have a very different form as well um, to what we're showing. Now, when I have a, almost always a peel will look like this. If I have normal forces, I can either have force displacements that look like this, so just up and over, very simple hill, okay? This is what's called attack force, if you ever hear about of attack force. And this is what's attack energy is, basically the area under this curve. If I change something about this material, so one, if I make the adhesive just thinner, okay? So if I just make the adhesive thinner, that curve will change into something that looks like this. So I haven't changed anything about the material. All I've changed is the bond geometry a little bit, okay? Thicker versus thinner. And all of a sudden, my amount of tack energy goes up a lot, okay? My tack force, I'm not putting numbers on here, but I can say that it basically stays the same, okay? Or about the same. My point in introducing a lot of this is that the geometry and material properties can change a lot about how things fail. And once you start to understand this, you can start to engineer it and take advantage of it in building lighter, maybe stronger, uh, maybe more stable um, resistant structures um, for buildings and architecture. I'm going to flip through a lot of this. My, my point in bringing the next few slides is that a lot of people have thought about these different loadings. These are a number of different papers where they solve for this factor G that I've already introduced. They get to be able to predict the maximum force. So, so this P adherence is like the maximum force. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about any of this. This is looking at peel. Like I said, we can come back and talk if you're really interested. Um, this is looking at shear. So if I'm shearing my adhesive, I can, again, relate my force. This is going to bring me to a summary. So if I know the way that I'm loading my adhesive, normal, think about hanging from a ceiling. Peel, think about peeling a piece of tape from a table. Shear, shear block, hanging something on the, on the wall, okay? If I just consider the materials to be the same, and I have these different ways of loading, I can describe through a geometric term, okay, I'll introduce this in a minute, and a material property term, what controls the maximum force, which is probably what you as an architect or as an engineer cares about. How much force, how much load can I sustain? And what I want you to notice is that you're going to be, you've been taught and trained to focus on maximum stresses or using stress as a design criteria. If stress was the design criteria, then in these equations, this little a represents the radius of an area. It would go to the second power because radius squared is area. In this prediction here, it doesn't go squared. So if stress really meant something or was really powerful, this would go as A to the 2. In this one, you don't even see A in here. This, when I have a sphere, so what a sphere is, is like if I have my finger, literally my finger touching an adhesive and I'm trying to separate my adhesive, it has the maximum force of pulling my adhesive or my finger out of a piece of tape does not depend upon the maximum area that I make at all. It only depends upon the GC, which is the strength of those Vanderwall bonds, which I have really very little control on, and the curvature of my finger has no dependence upon how hard I push, how much area I push in. Doesn't care about that at all. The maximum force is just dictated by the curvature and the Vanderwall bonds. Okay. So again, if I was trying to design a ball joint based on stress, I'd be totally wrong. My structure would fall. Okay? Because it doesn't follow that type of scaling. Same with peel. Peel, let's look down here. This is uh, 90 degrees, so that's pi over 2 is 90 degrees. It's like I'm peeling my tape straight up as I separate it. 
This is that Van der Waals bond. B is the width of my tape. It doesn't matter how long my tape is at all. It only matters on the width. Okay? Again, if I designed based on stress, I'd be totally wrong. Shear block, you can see, becomes even more complicated. It's the square root of B, square root of H. This does have an area dependence um, in, a, in a little funny regime, but I'm not going to focus on it. The only difference between this normal and flat, because this is, is that compared to having a, my finger pulling out of the tape, if I have like a column pulling, so it's flat on the end, um, and I try to separate it, it now not only depends upon the Van der Waals strength GC, but it also depends upon the mechanical properties, this elastic modulus of my adhesive. Here, it doesn't depend upon the mechanical properties. Okay? So a lot of this is just trying to teach you that Depending upon, you have to know something about how you're loading it in order to be able to design and use these materials. It's not that we can't figure that out, but you have, it's a little bit different education process of how to design um, with adhesives than with, say, um, using rivets or nails or screws. A little bit different uh, design process. So the, in the shear formula, you have two more parameters, width and... Oh, yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah, mu um, is the shear modulus. It's typically, for these materials, it's one-third of E. It's my fault for not changing that. Sorry. I could have, you could basically substitute in E here. T is, T is the thickness of the adhesive. Yeah. So the thinner the adhesive, the higher the um, force that it takes to um, separate the two. Little not conventional also. You'll hear many people that want to use a thicker adhesive to get more bond. Okay? But actually, if you can make an interface, the reason why you use a thicker adhesive it's because it's usually easier for a, a contractor or a builder to make and apply equal pressure over your whole surface. So that allows you to get more area in contact. Going back to my first kind of thesis statement that the first step is always making interfacial area. Okay? So the thicker it is, it's usually easier to make um, area. But you're actually hurting yourself in terms of the shear performance okay, by making it thicker. So now I'm going to take a, a, a diversion. I'm going to come back to that chart. Okay? And now I'm going to start telling you about Gex skin. What we wanted to do um, when we were thinking about Gex skin, and this is, uh, let me step back a minute. What we wanted to do was do two things. One, we wanted to start to understand how geckos perform. And I'm going to introduce that in a minute. But two, scientifically, like I said, I have a civil engineering undergrad, material science graduate degree. What I like to do is try to find, these are what we call scaling theories. I like to try to find scaling theories which can then transform into design principles that I can hand off to engineers to actually build with, okay? And try to simplify what we wanted to do was take and combine all of these differences. They're all, they all look different, they all are different. We want to combine them into one factor that I can start to teach engineers or architects of how to engineer with. Okay? And the way we did that by, was by looking to nature. And I'll, and I'll start to explain this a little bit more to you. So, um, taking inspiration from nature, it's been, you know, around for thousands of years. Okay? Um, one of the best early stories, anyway, is the story of Icarus and Daedalus. The reason I like to start here, most people know the story. Yeah? Okay? They, the bio-inspiration obviously came from birds um, and had this capability that humans could not achieve at the time, and that was flight. And they looked at birds and looked at the surface of the bird, okay? And the obvious difference is that birds have feathers, humans do not. Therefore, feathers must enable flight, right? It seems logical. It's very logical. And so they designed a, a set of wings based on um, the surface structures, the keratinous so feathers are made out of keratin, which is the same material as your hair, okay? Um, remember that word, keratin. The keratinous features, they covered them onto these flying structures. And obviously, you know the, the myth or the legend. It didn't go so well, right? Um, it didn't work out. So now, bioinspiration, we're going to come back to. And, and um, I, I think maybe actually I took some of the, the words out of my later slide. Um, uh, in terms of flight, What's interesting is that the subsurface structures actually become even more important. Go back about 500 years to Da Vinci. Da Vinci started to realize it was the stiffness in the shape of the wing, 
So the stiffness provided by the skeleton, which is below the surface, that stiffness plays the most critical role in enabling the, the flight and the, the um, presentation of the performance of birds, okay? And so subsurface structures, which we find actually in our planes today, right? It's the shape and the stiffness of the wing structure, not the, the feathers alone, not the feathers at all that provide flight. Now, final exploration has been used for a long time in architecture, okay? This is the uh, Crystal Palace, um, which, whose um, inspiration was found on the, on the underlying or under surface of a lily pad and started to introduce kind of the concepts of using truss-like structures, hierarchical truss-like structures to give rise to an airy presentation and the ability to support massive weight with a lot of open space, okay? Um, so this is a purely bio-inspired um, evolution or, I mean, presentation. And obviously, Velcro is a very common, almost modern day, if you will, bio-inspiration that has influenced society in good and bad ways. Um, but they took um, inspiration from the bristles as you walk through the, the forest or the field um, and the natural ability of the, uh, the bristles of the, of the um, seeds of the um, plants to attach to um, other hairy-like structures. And so you have hooks and loops that basically come together to form little bonds, um, entangled bonds in a physical way at a, at a larger length scale. Now the gecko is also another example of evolutionary innovation, okay? And the gecko has amazed um, humans, again, for thousands of years. You can find articles written on it, um, stories written about the, the mystery and the wonder of a gecko, which can you know, run, run along this floor, stop whenever it wants, obviously, come to that wall or to a, a nearly vertical surface of any rock or any tree or any synthetic material and climb up that wall with ease, okay? It can stop again in the middle of that and then continue on to an overhang, okay, like our ceiling. Again, stop in the middle of this overhang whenever it wants and continue on. And what the gecko is doing in that whole process is forming and breaking, forming and separating bonds, okay? They use adhesion for locomotion, okay? And there's been a lot of debate over hundreds, if not more, of years about how a gecko does this. The reason why the gecko has received the most kind of wonder and amazement on um, or with is because it's the largest of the organisms that have been found, at least, or known in written history um, that uses adhesion for locomotion. So insects and bugs, um, spiders, use adhesion also um, to climb and attach to surfaces. But it's the gecko that is the largest, okay? And obviously, as humans, we're all interested in things that are large and how do they get up to that amount of force, okay, and the ability to do this at a large, um, in a large way. So the gecko has created this wonder. This is a toke gecko. This is actually, her name is Big Mama. She's um, down the road here in Morrill in the labs of Duncan Urshek, and I'll introduce Duncan in a few more minutes. Um, but um, Big Mama is a toke gecko, about that big, okay, and they can attach right here. She's attaching to a glass plate, and you're looking through the glass. And then when it wants, it basically peels back its toes and can um, release the attachment force just through a peel mechanism like we were showing under the peeling of that bond um, a few minutes ago. Now, we are not the first people, like I said, to be amazed by this. And really, since the late 1990s, about 1999, um, there's been a huge push across the world, I'll say upwards of 40 to 50 different research groups at its peak, trying to understand not only how geckos work, but also how we can take our understanding of how a gecko works and try to build that into new engineered material systems that can behave like a gecko system, okay? Um, and almost everybody started focusing um, on the small nanoscale features that cover the toe pads of geckos. They also cover the toe pads of many insects and spiders. These fiber-like structures or hair-like structures are called spatulae, okay, and setae. So the way to think about this, I'm sorry for the blurriness of this image here, these are setae, okay, these are made out of keratin, same material as your hair, same material as your fingernails, same material as feathers of a bird. 
They are arranged into these rows that are called lamellae onto the toe pads of the gecko. Okay, so where do you see these rows? If you zoom in with a microscope, you'll start to see these setae. On the tips of the setae, so out here, they split again into these spatulae. Okay? And so this scale bar is about 200 nanometers. The width of one of these spatulae is about 200 nanometers. Just to give you an idea on, so your hair, the diameter of your hair is about 50 microns. So this is 25 microns. So take that times two. That's the width of your hair. Okay? So their setae are about 10 microns, 10 to 15 microns. At the tip, they split down into millions of these setae. Again, this is 200 nanometers. So you're several orders of magnitude um, smaller than your hair at the tip. And in fact, the thickness here at the very tip is about five nanometers. So it's about one molecule thick at the tip. Okay? They're, these are amazing structures, amazing structures. And because of some of the discoveries that were made right in 1999 in terms of measuring the force of one of the, they measured the attachment force of a single spatula and of a series of setae. A person by the name of um, um, Keller Autumn made those measurements. Everybody started to think that these hairs were the, the reason why a gecko could perform the way it performs. Okay? And so many material scientists, many mechanical engineers, many um, chemical engineers started to make materials um, with hairs. We were part of this as well. We were making many. I'm not highlighting those. I, I could later. Um, this is an example of some materials made out of a Professor Li Ming Dai's group, who's out of Case Western. They took a silicon wafer, covered it with carbon nanotubes, okay, and with a little sil um, silicon wafer, about a centimeter by a centimeter, so um, wide, like your fingernail, they could hold up a textbook, okay? The problem is, if I tried to make this silicon wafer, or this chip, just a little larger, this piece of would fall, or this textbook would fall. So if I made the chip larger, it actually held up less force. That does not make sense, right? Does not make sense. Similarly, um, this is a sticky bot. Um, they tried, and these engineers, um, Kukowski, um, who's a, a great um, engineer, roboticist out at Stanford, um, made adhesives based on fibrils like this. They also were limited for a long time on making larger robots that could climb. This one is about that big, something like that. Okay? So direct mimicry, just copying the structure of the gecko, did not lead to a scalable engineering. What they were following was a principle that, or some scaling laws that were set up by this plot. And this was collected by Edward Arts and Stanislav Gorb. Stanislav Gorb is a, um, a, an evolutionary biologist over in Germany, wonderful scientist, wonderful person. Um, he counted the number of hairs per area and plotted it as a function of the size scale or the mass of these different organisms, beetles, flies, bugs, spiders, lizards. And what you see is the larger the organism, oh, sorry, the larger the organism, the more hairs they found on the area or on, per toe. So this, if I extrapolate this out to a human, which will be around here, it says I must have this many hairs, so about um, 10,000 or so hairs per centimeter or micron squared. And what that says is that I must have these features that are on the order of five nanometers. So I have to have hairs that are about five nanometers. In order to do that, I have to use carbon nanotubes, just like on the previous slide. But I already told you that didn't work. And the reason why it didn't work is that actually if you look deeper into biology, and this is the same plot, so this is the number of hairs per area as a function of mass. But now what these scientists did, and there were actually two groups that published within a few months of each other, they actually collected more data points for climbing lizards, basically geckos. And all of these climbing points here are for um, the geckos, okay? And we're changing by a fact, the mass of the gecko by 10,000 times. So four decades on this pl log plot. And what you see is that there's really no relationship between the mass of the gecko up here and the number of hairs. So this says no matter how many, how large I want to become, the gecko is not changing the number of hairs. They're not changing anything about the hairs to actually hold up more and more weight, 
Okay? So this says that there must be another reason of how geckos are actually, what are they changing? They're changing something about their body that allows them to be able to have small geckos and large geckos all climb with adhesion. So this was the question that we started to ask as a group, was how to think about this. And I know I'm running, I'm starting to run short on time, so I'm going to start to um, speed through a, a little bit of this. Basically, we wanted to ask this question, how to, how to, or why did nature not go from leaf beetles, something as small as a leaf beetle, all the way up to a gorilla in terms of allowing them to all use adhesion? These three use adhesion for locomotion. This one does not. I had a postdoc, Andrew Kroll, and a PhD student, Mike Bartlett, who joined the team very close to each other, 2008, 2009. We started to think and develop actually the math behind this first. We developed a theory for what controls the force capacity, the amount of load that could be used for reversible adhesives, so on, off, on, off as we climb or walk, in the context of biological locomotion. Um, there were three different assumptions that went in. One, forces balance is very easy. Two is that we're going to assume that there's no energy dissipated in the system. And that's contrary to what's conventionally used in pressure sense adhesives. I didn't harp on that much in the last few slides, but it's very contrary to what, everything I told you. Um, and then finally, that there's an instability built in, um, which is taken advantage of often in, in um, nature. And we developed a very simple equation. I'll show it in, in variables in a minute. But it basically has three components. The force capacity of any bond in this context can be determined by the strength of your Van der Waals bonds, which I put up a chart that's been well known for 100 plus years. The amount of area that you can establish. And inversely related to the compliance of the whole system. So this Compliance is the opposite of stiffness, right? How compliant something is is basically how soft something is. So what this says is if I want my force capacity to be large, I need to make my area large, but I need to make my system compliance very, very small. That means I have to make my system as stiff as possible. Okay? And if I maximize the stiffness, then I will climb and with ease at a larger organism or a larger load. It's very counterintuitive. This is everything in equations. You're going to see this equation a lot. I'm going to plot force against this ratio of area over compliance. Okay. We went through and measured it. Um, these are some experimental plots. We would basically measure force versus displacement. This is a shear load, just like climbing um, or hanging a picture on a wall. Um, we went through. This is our prediction line. This is all the data from hundreds of measurements for different material systems, different geometries. Basically all follows. Um, we went on um, to do this not only under shear, but we did it normal. So this is taking a rigid cylinder, aluminum cylinder, pulling it away from an adhesive substrate. Okay, just like this. Don't worry about the details. Um, this is the plot to look at force capacity against this ratio of area over capacity or area over compliance. Again, all of the experimental data and our prediction line through here. Okay? So shear, normal. We're starting to understand how to think about this in a, in a general way. We can also start to think about how do we take advantage of this formula? How do we actually make an adhesive that is going to be very, very strong? Okay? And there's two things. Like I said, you have to make a lot of area, and you have to have the system stiff. Now, typically, if I want to make something conform, just like I was describing when Alex asked about thickness, if I want to make something conform, if I'm trying to make something really conformal, then I get a soft piece of foam, or I make my adhesive thicker, and it's easier to push down on it and make contact everywhere. That's the way we conventionally think. Okay, as engineers, make it soft. I'm going to be able to equalize my distribution of force and make contact everywhere. But that comes at a trade-off, right? Because in order to make all my large area of contact, large A, I'm making my system softer. So my A and C are, that ratio is not climbing. The way to take advantage of this is a mechanism called draping. It's another concept that we're all familiar with. Draping. We have clothes that naturally drape. We have tablecloths that naturally drape. 
if I pull a, along the fibers of a, of a fabric, of woven or non-woven fabric, these fibers are very stiff, but yet due to the connectivity and the, the small diameter of the fibers, they also bend with ease. Very little is given up with, e or with bending energy. And the stretching energy is also because of the contacts between the fibers is actually very weak. So I can actually stretch and bend with ease. That allows me, this draping concept allows me to actually conform to any geometry with a stiff material. And so I can take a stiff material that can drape and make a lot of area of contact. So what, what we did was just, this was the first So that nylon fabric was bought down at Joanne Fabrics in the Hampshire Mall. One day after having this brainstorm, we took it and put basically the equivalent of bathroom caulking onto it, just a, a uniform layer of bathroom caulking on top of this nylon fabric. We're attaching it to plexiglass. Okay? That's a, a, about a four by four piece of adhesive. So the minute you tilt, it becomes unstable. And that was part of the prediction. I didn't, it's a part that I'm not emphasizing here. I, I, I'll come back a little bit. That was totally predicted. But within a, within a day of this brainstorm, literally, we had a, the brainstorm on a Sunday. We bought the materials on a Monday. We made this test on a Tuesday, okay? All based on the math. We were able to hold up 45 pounds, which is a lot larger than any of those examples that I showed you before, okay? We then went, because our, hopefully this won't get, Jammed up. Let me see if it. We went and we knew that nylon fabric is not the, the stiffest fabric that you can find. You can actually go to carbon fiber Kevlar band, or bands. You can actually go to carbon fiber all alone and make fabrics out of these. We went from 90 pounds was our maximum capacity with that piece that you just showed or I showed you, all the way up to holding 700 pounds on the same size piece of material, just by changing the material of the fabric. Nothing about the adhesive. 700 pounds is a lot of weight, as you might imagine, over a um, 16 square inch piece of material. We went on, we brought on another PhD student, Dan King. We started to understand and study the structure of these. Uh, this is just a nice little movie showing that we can hang 250 pounds freestanding weight. So, I'll let this play, and then I'm going to skip through really quick at the, uh, the next several. He's making contact just with a roller. Nothing special about that. Just making sure we have good area of contact, just like he would spread out anything. Now he's lowering the 250 pounds so that the weight now is transferred onto this gex skin pad. Now the weight is transferred from the chain onto the pad, and then they do a little jig. All right. So I'm going to sk skim through so that in case there's some questions. Um, we have worked all this out in terms of simple spring models. We can describe all the different parts of our device, the pad, the skin, the tendon. All of them play a role in terms of maximizing our hotspots for the highest force capacity of these pads all following a simple equation. We also were able to develop and expand this simple equation into a more complex equation to account for all different roughnesses. So everything from frosted glass to aluminum to wood, paint and drywall. We can optimize the material properties depending upon if we want something to stick to all of these or if we want something to stick to only one. Okay, so we can use the math to design and our knowledge of material properties to design our system. This was a movie, you can find this up on YouTube. Actually, many of these you can find on YouTube. We hang up a, a flat screen TV monitor, basically, on all these different surfaces um, with the same pad, no surface prep, um, even go outside. Here, I'll, I'm gonna skip. If you're interested in watching this after, um, happy to play it. I'm gonna do an elevator, elevator music. That's all the, this is all the same tape. 
outside. It was about a 50 degree drop on that day. There's the side of our building. There's the curved marble. Um, here's like a sandstone concrete you know, wall. And then after they go from the concrete wall, they go back to um, glass. So they'll hang this on glass again. No cleaning, no prep between all of that. Okay. Somebody comes out. This was a first take. They, were actually, they did this for a group meeting just to show me. So they were a little nervous. They had never done this before. They go on from there to do a stop sign. What I want to finish on, you can, that's all shear load. I can also tilt my interface through. There's a, there's a lot of details of how we connect the tendon into what we call the skin. And so we can have very strong performance across a range of angles. He'll, he'll um, start to peel this from different angles and show that the bond doesn't fail until we get to a critical angle, which we can control. So there it fails. Um, three-year-olds can use it. He was not three at the time, but I have a three-year-old that will come in. These are my kids. We are hanging up our iPad around the house. Um, so this works. Uh, people kept on questioning me, can a three-year-old do this? And so the answer is yes. Uh, this is the performance of the gecko, the green. This is the performance of a, one of our Gexkin devices across all these different substrates. And then what's cool about this, and it, we'll leave it for another, another day, another lecture, is that this whole equation actually gave us new insight into actually how the gecko works. Okay? We were able to take this theory, start working with Duncan Urshik, who has now 50 geckos based on a, a grant that he and I got, went through and tested the force capacity of geckos. I won't play this for right now. And um, we actually take all of the synthetic adhesives, all of our biological adhesive or the green data points, and this is our theory over 14 orders of magnitude. Um, and the cool thing is, I'll tell you this, the geckos actually have tendons that connect their bone into their skin, so all subsurface. And it's actually their tendon structure, which is actually, in my opinion, the most enabling part of the gecko anatomy for adhesion. It's not the hairs, okay? Um, we also can make these out of a variety of materials that are compostable. This is, um, uh, this is hemp and natural rubber. We can make it out of jute, out of um, a variety of different natural fabrics as well, um, which is pretty cool and get the same performance. And I'll come back here. What we can do, this is um, everything I showed you before, the complexity. And if I take this very simple formula, I can actually show that it's, this simple formula is equivalent to all of these. So you, if you look from here to here, this is equivalent. And I'm just... This is for a different lecture, but I'm teaching you how you take A and C, and I can get to that same equation. So we arrived at our goal of having a very simple way. All you have to do is understand area and compliance. Area is just geometry. Compliance, again, is something that you've all learned in different geom or engineering classes, so how to calculate compliance. Once I know that, I can predict my force capacity. So... Pressure-sensitive adhesives provide a tunable, robust materials platform for building construction. Scaling pr principles, I believe, provide really critical lessons for design. And unstable fracture, and this is something that's interesting to me, really provides new insight into how climbing works. And I think it's actually a new opportunity. We usually don't want to think about instability in structures, but I actually think instability at bonds may offer some new kind of novel concepts for design. I'm happy to talk about that later. Um, this was funded um, by a variety of sources, at, um, NSF initially, National Science Foundation, then DARPA for a few years, then um, the Center for UMass Industry Research on Polymers, and finally the Human Frontier Science Program allowed us to make some connections between our theory and the animals. We have a company, which um, Duncan and I are both have a financial interest in, to disclose that. Also, I'm disclosing that I am the academic advisor for Pressure Sensitive Tape Council, and I do receive an honorarium for that service. So this is full disclosure. Uh, not trying to sell anything about PSTC. Um, this is the team that was responsible for the Gexkin work. I already introduced Duncan, Mike, Andrew, Dan, Mike and Bergia. Beth Parrott was an undergrad art history major. Critical role in terms of selling all of our devices. And Satyan is a current PhD student. Big Mama. Um, these are the list of names, um, and this is my current group, um, and they are awesome. Thank you. Thank you.